Good afternoon. Welcome. I don't know if you can hear me, so I'm going to make sure that you can. Good afternoon. My name is Selena Namoff. I'm um, an education co-chair for Abrahamic Initiative. And on behalf of Abrahamic Initiative, I want to welcome you to today's lecture. Uh, the mission of the Abrahamic Initiative is to foster mutual understanding and appreciation among Abrahamic faith traditions through education, dialogue, and action. Serving that purpose, the Education Committee is delighted to offer this opportunity for people of all faith traditions to better understand the history of the United States' early work on documents to secure religious freedom in this country. Today's speaker is a teacher, mentor, historian, and author, Joy Hakeem. Hakeem. I like Hakeem, too. Joy earned a bachelor's degree in government at Smith College a master's degree in honorary doctorate from the Goucher College. She has taken courses at John Hopkins, Harvard, Bennington, Cornell, and the Wharton School of Business. She has written as a general reporter, a business reporter, an associate editor, and editorial writer at Norfolk, Virginia Pilot. She was an assistant editor at McGraw-Hill's World News and a freelancer for a number of publications. As a teacher in Syracuse, New York, Omaha, Nebraska, and Virginia Beach, Joy has taught in elementary school, middle school, high school, and community college. Having struggled to find more valuable history texts for her students, Joy took a sabbatical to write some of her own, the result of which was a 10-volume set, A History of, the, of Us. It was met by acclaim from the highest authorities, most importantly being students from all over the country. Fifth grader John from Hearst Elementary in San Diego writes, other books just give information plain and flat. You make it fun. I don't know exactly how you made social studies fun, but you did. And I thank you for that. Joy began writing about science on a direct request from her young history textbook fans. Her US history books received the first ever James A. Michener Award for writing by the National Council for Social Studies two Parents' Choice Awards, and several Education and Library Awards. The Story of Science was named the 2007 USA Book News' Best Book in General Science category and the 2008 Benjamin Franklin Award for Education, Teaching, Academic. Selector's Choice 2008, CBS, CBC, NSTA's Outstanding Science Trade Books for Students and was also selected as a finalist in the 2008 Colorado Book Awards. Joy collaborated on the script for the 16-part PBS series, Freedom, A History of Us, with Katie Couric as a narrator, Christopher Reeve as creative consultant, and a large group of Hollywood stars as voices. She is the author of an accompanying book. Joy lives here in Denver with her husband, Sam. They have three children and five grandchildren. And now it gives me exceeding honor to present to you one of the most brilliant people I've ever met and my good friend, Joy Hagem. Selena is one of the most brilliant young people I know. Um, let's see if we. Um, I'm a writer, not a speaker, so make sure if you don't hear me, tell me, wave, do, you know, whatever. What this is. Um, a few years ago, one of Harvard's great American historians, Bert, look louder, okay. Hmm. I'm not going to hold it. <laughs> we have to figure out, we have to figure out something else. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, and this thing, let's see, what, what do I do? I'm supposed to have this here. Uh, the recorder, is somebody recorded it? Okay, all right, we'll leave it here. It's kind of wobbly. All right. A few years ago, one of America's and, and Harvard's great American historians, Bernard Balin, wrote this. The Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom is the most important document in American history, bar none. That's quite a statement, especially as no one I know has ever heard of the statute. 
as it happens, not long after I read those words, I was at a historian's conference, and I met Professor Balin. I said to him, um, you have heard about the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution? He, uh, he chuckled a bit, looked me in the eye and said, well, maybe I overstated things, but I don't think so. Then he explained that while Jefferson's declaration is an eloquent announcement of our decision to rule ourselves, its ideas were common parlance among liberal thinkers of the day. All men are created equal, says our declaration. We're still struggling with that concept. As for the Constitution, it's a working document, a guide to governance, written at a time when all the colonies had been or were writing constitutions. In contrast, the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, also written by Thomas Jefferson, is unique and groundbreaking. No government before had ever taken the astonishing stand that it takes. In essence, it says that religious belief is a personal thing, a matter of heart and soul, and that governments have no right to meddle with beliefs. In England, John Locke had written a famous letter on religious tolerance. In Virginia, Jefferson's good friend James Madison made the point that Jefferson's statue is not about tolerance, which suggests a kind of superior-inferior relationship. This document is about full acceptance and equality. Actually, it's about jurisdiction. The point being that governments have no business telling people what they should believe. Jefferson and his peers called it freedom of conscience. The Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom would lead directly to the First Amendment, which was written by Madison, and to the religious freedom the freedom of the mind that is and has been an American hallmark. It would make us one of those rare nations that has never fought a war over religion. In the past, governments had traditionally thought it among their chief duties to tell their citizens what to believe. They saw themselves in loco parentis, which means in a parental role and religion is something parents teach their children. But adults should be able to think for themselves, said Jefferson. And no matter what you legislate, think thinking people will believe as they wish. Here are some of his words on the subject. These from the only book he ever wrote, Notes on Virginia. <laughs> The legitimate powers of government extend to such acts only as are injurious to others. But it does me no inquiry, injury for my neighbor to say there are 20 gods or one god. It neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg. Here's more. To suffer the civil magistrate to, include his, to intrude his powers into the field of opinion is a dangerous fallacy which at once destroys all religious liberty. These were ideas he discussed with Madison, a man whose intellect matched his own. Their world was very different from the one we inhabit. It was a realm where most people weren't expected or trusted to think for themselves. To understand that world, let's head for Boston. It is 1651 some 30 years after the Mayflower's arrival. We can watch as a Baptist is lashed on his bare back. Why? For being a Baptist and daring to invade Massachusetts territory. To those watching with us, Baptist beliefs are heresy. By beating a Baptist, they believe they are doing God's will. A few years later, Mary Dyer, a Quaker, is hanged in front of the Boston State House for the crime of claiming that she is without sin, a dangerous opinion that Puritan authorities say overthrows the whole gospel. From today's perspective, that hanging seems outrageous. 
But the good Puritans of the day saw themselves as enlightened and patient. They had warned Mary again and again before sending her from their colony. But she kept returning. She thought she was doing God's bidding. And so did they. They did what they believed they had to do. After all, it was the job of the magistrates to lead their people in the path of godliness in a corrupt and sinful world. The Puritans had come to Massachusetts to build a city on a hill. It was to be a beacon of righteousness that would shine a light for the whole world to see. So the Puritans banished Anne Hutchinson and Roger Williams. They fined William Colburn 100 pounds for welcoming Quakers into his home. They sent 18-year-old Thomas Aikenhead to the gallows for denying the truth of the Trinity. And they hanged Mary Dyer for preaching the message of the Quakers. Was Massachusetts unique? If we head for New Amsterdam, we can see some Jews arriving in the harbor. It is 1654, and Governor Stuyvesant asks them to leave. If we allow them to stay, Stuyvesant says, we might have to accept Papists, which means those dreaded Catholics. <laughs> As for Quakers, Stuyvesant orders the public torturing of Robert Hodgson, an influential Quaker preacher. And he issues an ordinance punishable by fine and imprisonment against anyone who harbors Quakers. Meanwhile, Flushing, out on Long Island, has a town charter that promises settlers freedom of conscience. So when some locals hear what is happening to the Quaker preacher, they write a remonstrance, a petition to Governor Stuyvesant saying, we desire in this case not to judge lest we be judged. Rather, let every man stand and fall to his own master. Then they ask that Quakers and all others be allowed freedom to believe as they wish. What does Stuyvesant do? He not only arrests the Quaker preacher, but also the citizens of Flushing who petitioned the issue. <laughs> but one Flushing set settler happens to be headed for Amsterdam. He argues this case before Stuyvesant's bosses at the Dutch West India Company. They call Quakerism an abominable religion. But being pragmatic businessmen, they see customer and worker potential in the outcasts. They need people in their colony. So they tell Stuyvesant to tolerate differences and let Quakers, Jews, and even Papists stay. It's a small step, and it doesn't lead to other legislation. But it's meaningful, because none of the Flushing petitioners is a Quaker. On to Virginia, the colony with the largest population. If you live in Virginia, according to a law in the books, you have to go to church every day, usually for both morning and evening prayer. If you don't go, you can be whipped, sentenced to work on an ocean-going galley, or worse. And you don't have a choice of churches. In Virginia, the established church is Anglican. That means you are assessed taxes to support that church whether you believe in it or not. And you can't be a member of the legislature unless you are a member of the established church. So the legislation of the House of Burgesses reflects the social world of the Anglican delegates. Meanwhile, some ideas are percolating in 17th century Europe that will eventually change the way most people think about their faith and almost everything else. A huge transition is coming. For most people, it, it will make, the, make the, their faith, faith in almost everything else seem a bit different. It will make faith a personal thing beyond the purview of state authorities. It happens outside the worlds of religion and governance. Governance. <laughs> this time, think 1666. I, I talk to children a lot, and I'm always telling them that history really isn't about dates, but there are a few that it helps to, to know. I'm astonished that the children, none of the children I meet know what 1492 is. I, I think that's a date 
you know, Americans should know. And 1666 is a major date in world history, and it's easy to remember because of all those sixes, 1666. We're, we're still more than 100 years before the American Revol Revolution. Two things are happening in London this year, a plague and a big fire. The city burns down, or at least most of it. Rebuilding it will lead to some rethinking of traditional institutions and values. As for the plague, the fire helps destroy its germs. Because of the plague, Cambridge University is shuttered in 1665 and its students sent home for two years. One of those students is a young man with a backpack of problems and complexes, but a very good mind. His name is Isaac Newton and he goes to his mother's home where he watches an apple fall from her apple tree and manages to connect that apple's fall to the trajectory of the moon above the tree. The year 1666 will be called his Annus Mirabilis, his miracle year. We're still dealing with the impact of his thinking during that year. Why did the apple fall down and not up, he asks. And what about the moon, which is in free fall through space? He does the math that connects those actions, and his calculations will eventually lead to the world we inhabit. Newton was very religious. He would write more words on God and religion than he wrote on science. But grappling with gravity made him realize that the universe has a mathematical foundation. It is orderly. It makes sense. And that challenges the idea of a capricious God, which is the way almost everyone conceives him. Newton isn't first to understand that math mathematics underlies our universe. Eratosthenes figured that out way back in the world of the ancient Greeks. He measured the Earth and got amazingly close to what we now know it to be. But Aristotle didn't agree with the idea of a mathematically based world. He thought math was a human construct, construct and was not inherent in the structure of the universe. For centuries, the church in Rome went with Aristotle. That capricious God and unpredictable universe still dominate thinking in the 1500s when Copernicus measures the movement, movement of Earth and Sun. Like Eratosthenes, he discovers that those movements can be plotted mathematically, which, if you take the next step, means God does not have to actively push the planets. Rather, they are responding to universal forces like gravity. The thinking that came from Copernicus, then Galileo, and then Newton, says the universe is grounded in rules and mathematics, and they can be tested and proved. It's an explanation that is still bothersome to many, but our modern world rests on it. In Joshua, the Bible says that the sun stood still and the moon stayed until the people avenged themselves upon their enemies. Follow Newton, and that phrase becomes metaphor. Newton, Newton made his ideas accessible to a few thinkers in a big book we now know as Newton's Principia. And that brings us back to the author of the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom. Thomas Jefferson owned two copies of Newton's tome, one in the original Latin and one in English. He must have discussed the book with Madison. We know he did with his sometimes friend, John Adams. That tough book, I have a, I have a copy of it, it is tough. Uh, that tough book became foundational to the Enlightenment and the political ideas it fermented. Here's why. If the universe responds to mathematical laws that can be analyzed, why not political institutions? Divine right to rule? Really? Philosophers began asking, what is the base for that idea? This kind of questioning was heresy, but it was the future. To put this all in a time frame, Newton was 82 when young Ben Franklin, age 18, made his first trip to England. Newton's ideas were the rage in Europe, and Franklin would dine on them. 
Newton was famous for his experiments with color using a prism. Franklin examined colors and found that they absorb heat at different rates. Ben calculated the course and temperature of the Gulf Stream and figured out that ship's captains could follow it by using a thermometer. But it was his studies of electricity that made him famous. He discovered that electricity, like gravity, is one of nature's forces. That electricity has positive and negative charges and that lightning is a form of electricity. All these were very important scientific discoveries and they were disturbing. Franklin took a lot of flack for his ungodly experiments. In a tradition that went back to the time of Charlemagne, that's the 1800s, consecrated church bells were rung during thunderstorms to ward off evil spirits. But that didn't seem to do it. In 1784, which was a year after the end of the American Revolution, a book published in Europe noticed that in a 35-year period, lightning had struck 386 German churches and killed 103 bell ringers. In the 18th century, church bell ringing was a high-risk profession. <laughs> Franklin's lightning rods changed that, but at first he was castigated for them, in Europe as well as at home. When an earthquake struck Boston, Franklin got blamed. It was said that his rod stole lightning from the skies and drained it into the earth. Sounds reasonable, <laughs> even though it's not true. Young Franklin, who would become one of the oldest founders, reveled in the intellectual ferment he found in England. When he came home to the colonies, he brought the ideas of the Enlightenment with him. In Virginia, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, who were among the youngest of the founders, read John Locke and Rousseau, as well as Newton, and participated in this age of reason. Jefferson was fascinated by science and thought of himself as a scientist. He wasn't. His brilliance was in political theory. He and some of his contemporaries took that Newtonian concept that the universe has orderly rules and turned it into political thinking. Why should there be capricious kings and emperors why not governments built on logical rules? Meanwhile, in the middle of the 18th century, something called a Great Awakening had taken hold in the colonies, and especially in Virginia. Some powerful preachers outside the established church were challenging traditional authorities in revival meetings where God was available to all people, rich or poor, and that sometimes even included the enslaved population. Theirs was a persuasive message, not exactly popular in a world of established hierarchies. Those hierarchies mostly didn't get what was going on at the revival meetings or among thinkers in Europe. Many stayed behind in intellectual bunkers. In Virginia, laws were passed to curtail the new religions and their ideas. If you became a member of one of them, the Methodists, the Presbyterians, or the Baptists, According to one law on Virginia's book, your children could be taken from you. Preachers of these new faiths were no longer being hanged, but they were being thrown in jail. A growing number of citizens began questioning the old ideas. In the last decades of the 18th century, things had begun to change, but you still had to be Anglican to hold office in Virginia, and circuit writer Francis Asbury was thrown in jail regularly for preaching Methodism. A Baptist preacher was locked up in the Orange County Jail when young James Madison walked by and heard the prisoner, undaunted, preaching from behind bars. Madison was impressed with the man's sincerity. With his incredibly logical mind, he asked himself, why are we doing this? A question that today seems reasonable enough, but was not often asked then. Madison and his good friend Tom Jefferson seem to have, have had conversations on the subject. In the momentous year 1776, Jefferson asked a rhetorical question in the Virginia House of Burgesses. Has the state a right to adopt an opinion on matters of religion? 
The next year, he will write a first draft of his statute on, on religious freedom. That statute disestablished, disestablished the Church of England and then guaranteed freedom of religion to people of all religious faiths. So the big idea behind it, religion should be a personal choice beyond the purview of government bodies. Evangelical preachers and their flocks supported the idea of religious freedom, especially those living in Virginia's western counties, places that would become Kentucky and Tennessee. And they came to political meetings with long rifles on their shoulders, so people paid attention. Jefferson and Madison, both members of the elite, had strange bedfellows for their ideas on religious freedom. How about Muslims? Were they part of the picture? Jefferson had a copy of the Koran, and when talking of the world's religions often mentioned Turks, Jews, and infidels, by which he met Muslims, Jews, and atheists. He was intrigued by Islam, but had no idea that any Muslims lived in his country. As it happened, they did, possibly on his own plantation. We know that two of George Washington's slaves had the name Fat Fatima, which was almost certainly a reference to the daughter of Muhammad. How many slaves were Muslims? We don't know. But recently, several have been documented as such. Meanwhile, there was a problem that needed solving. We were at war. The colonies were trying to kick England off the continent. The Church of England had to go. Would an established American church replace it? Virginia's legislators, all Anglicans, were eager to maintain their leadership. Hardly any of them were prepared to let people choose their own religion or choose no religion at all. George Washington was on the fence. If people weren't made to go to church, would Virginians fall into immorality? He worried about that. So did others. It was in this milieu in 1779 that Jefferson introduced his statute into the legislature. It was immediately tabled. He tried again and again. Then Jefferson headed for Paris as ambassador and James Madison took up the cause. Patrick Henry didn't like Jefferson's idea at all. And Hen can you hear me or not? No, I think the Uh-oh. <laughs> oh, just a low battery. Okay, shout for a minute while I look for a battery. <laughs> Duh. If I use my voice, can you hear me in the back or not? Uh, all right, I'll. Tr um, I mean, if you can't wave or something. Um, then Jefferson headed for Paris as ambassador, and James Madison took up the cause. Patrick Henry didn't like Jefferson's idea at all. Uh, if you want to picture Patrick Henry, think about what's going on in um, Washington now, and think of the politician who makes, whoever he is, whatever, makes the most noise and the least sense. Uh, <laughs> that was Patrick Henry, an incredible um, orator. But uh, I can tell you that, that Jefferson and Madison were, were a little negative about him. Anyway. Henry, a consummate politician, was immensely popular. Henry came up with what seemed to be a fine idea. He introduced a bill that said Virginians would be taxed to support all Christian worship. His bill passed its first two readings, a third, and it would become law. Jefferson wrote to Madison from Paris, what we have to do is devotedly pray for his death. <laughs> I think he was kidding, I don't know. The pragmatic Madison, working hard in the legislature, got Henry kicked upstairs into the governor's chair where he had no vote. Madison then wrote a brilliant series of questions and answers, a remonstrance supporting religious freedom that was meant to convince the legislators. It's still a, a, a fabulous document. Then he reintroduced Jefferson's bill for establishing religious freedom and guided it through the legislature. 
it finally passed on January 16, 1786, but not with votes from a majority of the legislature. Most either abstained or voted against it. Still, it passed. What did Jefferson's statute say? Here are some of the key phrases. And you all have, you all have copies. No man shall be compelled to frequent or support any religious worship, place, or ministry whatsoever. And to suffer the civil magistrate to intrude his powers into the field of opinion is a dangerous fallacy, which at once destroys all religious liberty. And my... Hi. <laughs> all right. I apologize. All right. Is this the... Yeah. All right. My, well, this is good, because this is in time for my favorite line, which is... Truth is great and will prevail if left to herself. When Jefferson heard that his bill had passed, he had the text copied and distributed in Europe. He wrote to Madison from Paris, it is honorable for us to have produced the first legislature with the courage to declare that the reason of man may be trusted with his own opinions. You note the first legislature, they realized no one had ever done this before. I mean, this is a really innovative American document. It soon became clear that Virginians living under the statute were no more nor less immoral than they had been when they were forced to go to church. After years of agitation over the idea of religious freedom, it quickly became a popular concept. Now the political fight shifted to the, new, to the Constitution, which needed to be ratified by the 13 new states. Virginia was key. If it didn't ratify, the whole package would tumble. And now some Virginians, along with representatives of some other states, began objecting because the Constitution had no guarantee of religious freedom. Uh, they wanted a Bill of Rights. Madison believed that a Bill of Rights wasn't necessary, that it was the role of the states to each provide uh, basic freedoms. But he wanted to get the Constitution passed. So he promised he would write a Bill of Rights, which he did. Um, and he, beginning with the First Amendment that says, so Madison wrote the whole Bill of Rights. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or pre prohibiting the free exercise thereof. There's no argument at the time over that phrase. Virginians have argued about religious freedom for more than seven years. That battle is behind them. And re religious freedom is now a popular concept with both liberal and conservative thinkers. So the B Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, passes easily. As for George Washington, and when I go into, into schoolrooms, kids always ask me, who's your favorite American? And I'm always kind of sorry to have to say it's George Washington. You know, it just seems like I, would, I wish I could come up with somebody surprising. But George Washington really was the right man to get our government started. He, he just is a solid citizen. And anyway, it, um, as soon as the Bill of Rights was passed, he wrote in a famous letter to the Hebrew congregation in Newport, Rhode Island. These are his words. The citizens of the United States have a right to applaud themselves for having given to mankind, no, having given to mankind, examples of an enlarged and liberal policy, a policy worthy of imitation. All possess alike liberty of conscience and immunities of citizenship. It is now no more that toleration is spoken of, as if, as if it were the indulgence of one class of people that another enjoyed the exercise of their inherent natural rights. For happily, the government of the United States, which gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance, requires only that they who live under its protection shall demean themselves as good citizens. Washington's vice president, John's Ad John Adams, is blunt in stating what, what has now become a popular opinion. Congress shall never meddle with religion other than to say their own prayers, says John Adams. John Ad John James Madison has another take. 
Religion and government will both exist in greater purity the less they are mixed together. That statute will come to be seen as the foundation of American liberty. In several key 19th century decisions, the Supreme Court cites it as the basis for the First Amendment. In the 20th century, in 1961, Chief Justice Earl Warren writes that the court, quote, considered the happenings surrounding the Virginia General Assembly's enactment of an act for establishing religious freedom written by Thomas Jefferson and sponsored by James Madison as best reflecting the long and intensive struggle for religious freedom in America and is particularly relevant in the search for First Amendment meaning. But that view of Jefferson's statute as foundational is contested by William Rusk Rehnquist in a 1985 Supreme Court dissent in which he said that relying on Jefferson and Madison and the Virginia statute to understand the First Amendment is, quote, demonstrably wrong as a matter of history. Justices Clarence Thomas and Antonin Scalia have reiterated that view. This is a very of the moment issue, with some arguing that, its essence, that at its essence, this is a Christian nation and that the wall of separation that Jefferson wrote about in a famous letter to a Baptist congregation was not a widely held view among his peers. Others don't agree, seeing Jefferson's idea as a mission statement for the nation. So Jefferson's statute, today hardly known, has once again become a part of a political debate about the role of religion in America. Did Jefferson's hostility to a marriage of church and state include a distaste for religion? Merrill Peterson, who edited Jefferson's papers for the Library of America, wrote this. His hatred of establishments and priesthoods did not involve him in hatred of religion. He wished for himself, for his countrymen, not freedom from religion, but freedom to pursue religion wherever intelligence and conscience led. As for, as for Jefferson himself, he never had any doubts about the statute's importance. His directions for his epitaph, found after his death in his own handwriting, reads, on the face of the obelisk, the following inscription, and not a word more. Here was buried Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of, Ind of American Independence, of the Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom, and father of the University of Virginia. By these as testimonials that I have lived, I wish to be remembered. If you visit Monticello, you can see that obelisk. There is no mention of his presidency or of any other achievements. I guess. So I'm happy to do yeah. questions. So yeah, we're going to throw joy to the wolves, and um, you being the wolves. And um, we're interested in what questions you may have. You have many handouts also, or knowledge you already have that you'd like to know from Joy, who is the expert on many, many things. Oh, there's a question over here. And as our held, handheld mic has died a horrible death, can you, um, can you be heard to stand up? Oh, well, you know, they do. So, and I like Lincoln, too, <laughs> and a few others. Okay. We lived in Rhode Island before we came to Roger Williams. The letter that he had written to the temple there. How much of an individual act was that? How much was he... Uh, uh, well, George Washington, who had, had been... Um, to say on the fence, wasn't sure what to do about the statute. And when it, when it passed, and it, it, it just didn't change things. People were afraid, and, and he was, that, that um, Virginians would go out and, I don't know, murder, rape, whatever, that, that religion made a difference in daily behavior. And it doesn't, I don't know, you know, it, it didn't seem to. There was no right. So George Washington changed and just became quite enth wildly enthusiastic almost about about the idea of religious freedom. 
So, I mean, if you're from Rhode Island, I mean, Roger Williams is one of my big heroes. My gosh, yeah, he, I, mean, that's, I mean, we do have some incredible pe um, people in our history, and um, we don't teach. I mean, I'm very involved with schools, and, and we're just not teaching about them. And there's a guy who was a contemporary of of Washington, William Johnson. And I'm guessing that nobody here has ever heard of him, and. Unless they've read my, unless they've read my books, yeah. <laughs> and he was the most famous um, American colonist in the uh, when it, in Europe, and in, and as everybody in this country knew him. He was kind of a combination of Bill Gates and um, a war hero and a thinker, and um, the uh, one of only two colonists ever knighted by the British king. Um, we would not, the British would not have won the French and Indian War if it hadn't been for William Johnson. And if they hadn't won the, that, then they would, you know, everything would have been different. Um, William Johnson was written out of the history book. I mean, it's, I mean he also was the second largest, second richest American, uh, and it, it, because he controlled the, um, the fur trade. He came to this country. Um, he really captivated people in Europe. There were, there were ballads written about him. He was very handsome, very virile. And um, came to this country and went up to um, Albany and beyond and met Native Americans and became a, became a Native American. He was adopted into a, into a, um, uh, into a Mohawk tribe. He married the daughter of the leader of the Mohawks learned the language, um, you know, went, fought with Mohawks, and was a man who lived with perfect ease in both worlds. He would put on his, his British garb, get on his horse and go down to uh, New York and meet with um, the, the guys who were the standard founders. Um, he got written out of the books, I think, I'm pretty sure, because he married a uh, a native woman. I mean, it was this was a racist thing, and so um, uh, Lord Jeffrey Amherst, <laughs> um, uh, who was a contemporary and hated William Johnson, sent um, got a batch of, of uh, blankets from a smallpox hospital and sent them over to an Indian encampment, knowing exactly what he was doing. It's a germ warfare back in, you know. So, so here's, here's um, William Johnson parading around with his uh, wife, who was, who was really interesting in her own right, and their eight kids, and so he, he threatened them. Like, he's out of the history books. Why? And, and we have, we have his, his official papers and letters. He was enormous. Oh, and he, he fought the, the British, uh, the reason they gave him, um, they knighted him, is because they got him to lead armies, uh, or lead an ar a, a joint uh, Indian uh, colonist army in the, the French and Indian War, and he won all the battles. Um, he was a really, really interesting guy. Probably, if he had he died in 1775 of cirrhosis of the liver, he, 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 was, he liked parties. Um, his, you can still go to his great mansion in, in Johnstown, New York, named after him. Um, but if he had lived, he, he rather than uh, Washington, might have led the, uh, um, you know, the colonial, the, whatever, the armies and, and the Revolutionary War, because he was much more experienced. So anyway, we, there are all these great, this, that's a long answer to the, there are all these really interesting people in American history, and, and by and large, we don't know enough about them. What was, what was the occasion for Washington to write the letter to the synagogue in Rhode Island? Do we know? <coughs> Good question. I don't know. I should, that's something I should know. Um, hmm, I, I'll look it up. It's, I'm, sure, you know, I'm sure you can find it on the web. <laughs> but um, it's, it's just a you know, very famous, wonderful, wonderfully written letter. To, talking about writing, I just want to feel this. I, because of what I do, every once in a while, I haven't done it in a long time, but I used to teach a lot of writing courses. And when you're a writing teacher, there's sort of some givens that you always tell all your students. One is, 
you know, keep your sentences short. Um, uh, you, if there's a simple word you can use instead of a long word, do you know that? Um, Jefferson is just an incredible writer, and and he um, has written the most amazing sentence that I've ever read, I think. And um, he breaks all the rules, and because he's so good, he got away with it. But this whole thing down, including the second paragraph, is one sentence. <laughs> so, you know, when you, I, um, I, sometimes I used to take this and, you, you know, and show it to kids. This is one sentence, and because he's such a master of the language, it comes off. He, he you know, so use short sentences. Most of us need to use short sentences, but if you're a genius, you can do anything you want. Yeah. So how did things like our National Day of Prayer Prayers to begin legislative session. How did those well, get so established? Um, I can tell you that that the, the founders would have been very unhappy about that, and and James Madison felt that when Congress um, decided to hire a preacher or to, to have an opening prayer, he felt that the members of Congress should pay for that; that that should not come out of gov any government monies. But I mean, there is. But there is something to the uh, the uh, the majority of the legislators in in uh, Virginia, as I said, did not vote for the Virginia statute. They they preferred to just um, abstain. Or um, so there were a lot of you know there's always been this diversity, and there's still a, a lot of people who feel this is a Christian nation, and um, you know Jefferson and Madison would disagree. Um, you know, it's, it's an issue that really needs to be discussed. Uh, but I mean, if you look at world history, I mean, everybody fights over religion. I mean, like, the, you know, what's, we, we've saved ourselves that. Uh, you mentioned that this was the first uh, free exercise of religion clause by the state by, by government. You might look into the statements of the Jacobin kings of Poland in the 13th and 14th centuries came out and ran their countries on the basis of no religious prejudice, belief, or, or belief, anyone's beliefs for their own, and not to be put down to code. OK, I will. Um, I mean, this is pretty much the American historians see this this way. And the, I mean, the, the Flushing Remonstrance was before this. But it was, um, you know, it was for a tiny um, municipality. Uh, this was, this was, um, was major legislation. but. Um, I will, I will look into that. Mm -hmm. I was curious if you could talk about. Uh, I was curious if you could talk about Thomas Jefferson's religious convictions. There seems to be some disagreement. Uh, or is that a red herring? This, this kind of no, I mean, I you know you you can't um, speak for anyone, but he he was a man of he was certainly was not an atheist. Let's start there. Um, he did something called the Jefferson Bible, and I guess somebody told me it was here. A year or so, but I didn't see it. But what he did basically was took took a Bible and with and a scissors and cut out all the miracles and the the things that couldn't be explained scientifically and and uh, kept the story of, of Jesus's philosophy. I guess you, you know that's what that's what he believed in. Um, beyond that, it's well, first of all, there's, there's a lot written on that, I mean, and so you might want to you know read some books and go into some depth. But um, he was, it was probably a classic liberal look at, at religion. Uh, yeah. I remember reading a Supreme Court case that said, religions are always quick to demand the protections of the free exercise clause, but they don't want to take on the responsibilities of the established clause. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me with what's going on right now with these lovely ladies here in, in Denver, the little sisters of the poor, who don't want to, you know, pay for or even accept a deal on providing contraceptive care as part of insurance. That this seems to be really what we have to look at. Is that yes, you can exercise your religion, but you can't do it if it's going to break the law. And, and they are challenging it, and I think they have every right to do that, as they should. But I just kind of wondered your thoughts about, you know, how those two, you know, kind of not cuts, 
well, I think I mean, we are, we're a nation under law and, and precedent. And I think in order, and, and religion is something people, you know, it gets you in your gut. And uh, I think that um, in order to deal with those kinds of issues, we really, it really helps to know where, you know, where our um, freedoms come from. Um, I mean, reading Jeff, uh, Madison's Remonstrance, um, it has 16 statements on, on religious freedom and, and answers. It, has, it asks questions and answers them. Is very, you know, you can address issues like that. I mean, that's the. I mean, that's part of adult discussions because I happen to be um, sort of um, an extremist when it comes to issues of gun control. You know, a lot of people would not. I mean, I'm. I just let's not. Let's just let's not have any. You know, I'm going to go to the farthest extreme. But so I kind of read the Second Amendment differently than a lot of my friends do, and and that's you know you just kind of have to have discussions where you agree to disagree. You understand that you're not you know, whatever. I, it, it's it's hard to have. There is no one answer to a lot of questions, and I think probably that is one of them. Yeah? You talk about Jefferson, but how did Jefferson get the northern colonies to agree to this when you have some of the extremists and the Puritans and well, all of those, the Quake, you know, those, those areas that were really cracked down on religious freedom of any kind? How did they agree to this constitution well, the, the, the examples I gave you of, of um, you know, killing Quakers and things like that were all pre-Newton. Okay, Newton came along and really did change the world. And it took a long time to get from the understandings that, and we're, we're still a lot of people won't accept um, modern science, but the world had changed a lot. And there, um, and, and also, the fact of the of our breaking away from England was was momentous. I mean, England was the great power in the world, and and we were doing our own thing. And so that that occasion brought forth the really the the best and the brightest the the caliber of people at the Constitutional Convention was astonishing. And what was even more astonishing, if they left behind, while that was going on, the, the, the states were, were making their own constitutions, and so they were having their own conventions and meetings. And if you look at the caliber of people in those conventions, it was still astonishing. So the, it was a moment in history, and, and the, colon, the, the new the citizens of the new nation understood that something was happening in their world that might not happen again or not in their lifetimes. And so the best and the brightest appeared. And so we can look back on, uh, I mean, there were a lot of idiots too, but, um, but mostly there were some amazing people and the caliber of the discussions. It's, um, you know, it's very inspiring to read a lot of that. Yeah, let's see. Wouldn't it also be somewhat impacted by the fact that Pennsylvania was somewhat of a Quaker refuge. Mm -hmm. Maryland was a Catholic refuge. Yeah. So you had this melting pot developing anyway, where we were all going to be a big mix. And so I'm sure that had some impact on it as well. Yeah, yeah, there were places that you could go, but also there was room. I mean, you know, now we have the problem of a whole lot of people squeezed into small spaces. And it, yeah, if you were if you were a renegade and unhappy, you could just go out on the frontier somewhere and do your own thing. Mm -hmm. Not the same defense as my home state. Um, Massachusetts did change drastically they, between, yes. between the seventh, sixteenth, seventeenth, yes. and yes. eighteenth. Yes. 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 There was almost complete tolerance before the revolution. I mean, there yeah. were Anglican churches in Massachusetts. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and a lot of that was what what was coming from from Europe, the new thoughts. Um, although, yeah. Some of the Puritans had a hard time catching up, uh, but, uh, but yeah, the, the children, and when I see some zealots, I, um, 
I think that, you know, I, I know that their children and grandchildren may think very differently, and that's, that's what happened to the, uh, the Puritans. A lot of them couldn't handle what their children were. And we all go through that. <laughs> yeah. Would you comment on the influence of, of this movement towards religious freedom on Europe? I understand that to this day, most of the countries in Europe have established, have established churches. churches. And yeah. yet the, the practice is uh, pluralism and acceptance right. of religious freedom. But they haven't been willing to or able to disestablish the churches. Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, that's true. England has its Church of England and, and, and the Catholic Church. Um, well, Norway, all yeah, churches, yeah. I mean, I think it's it's just tradition. The the uh, you know the monarchies. I mean, most um, we have a, a son living in England now, so we're we're getting um, getting to learn more English history than we had. But I think a lot of people in England who don't who you know understand the folly of of, um, of the idea of hereditary kings and monarchies and all. But they just like it because it's tradition. It's kind of comfortable. Um, I mean, they can't be, they can't uh, explain it rationally. They can't. But um, it's, it's just tradition. And also, there's just a lot of um, inbred structure there. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> but we're lucky, not, I think, not to have that. Mm -hmm. uh, with regards to the. With regards to religious freedom, and I believe you were mentioning within seven years, it seemed to become accepted, right? No, or no, no. It was. It, it took. It was actually it took nine years, but it was seven really intense years where it was finally passed. But it wasn't accepted until it happened. Until it did pass, and nothing. I mean, people were were talking gloom and doom. So it was very quickly, even faster than that. Do you think there's any parallels with regards to the gloom and doom of the decriminalization of marijuana? I don't. It will be. I don't know. It'll be interesting. The, the, um, the New York Times today had, had a thing about um, Denver and some. Uh, I don't know if any of these. So this this. Um, these hotels that are now set up to have, uh, where you can go and, and uh, have um, pot parties. And I said, I don't know, <laughs> you know. This, I'm, I'm, Thank you. If it's not my expertise, I'm the wrong generation. <laughs> my, yes, my kids maybe, <laughs> I don't know. But it, it, it will be interesting. I think the real point is, and actually there is a parallel, that you can't, you can't, and in Jefferson and Madison both emphasize this, you can't force people to believe. You can force them to go to church, but you can't force them to believe. And we don't see, and, and prohibition and prohibition of drugs doesn't seem to work. And, and I mean, outrageous in this country, other than the number of people who are, the young people who are in jail for selling pot or smoking pot or whatever. I mean, that's just outrageous. So, we, I mean, actually, I'm, 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 I'm writing science books now. And pot, I think, we're beginning to find maybe more dangerous than we thought. So alcohol, too, they're finding new things. So it's not a good idea. But, you, you know, you can't outlaw it. And one of the amazing things that's happened in my lifetime is what happened with cigarettes. I mean, when I was young, when I was starting out on the newspaper, I, I mean, just going into the newspaper office was just, you know, whew. I mean, it was just, it was just smoke. And, and if we had parties, we always had to have um, ashtray. Everybody smoked. And we just threw, um, just by explaining to people the, the dangers of smoke, we, we got past it, not through legislation. And I, you know, I think maybe that I, certainly, Jefferson would, you know, would would say you got to you got to trust people's minds. Um, Jefferson and Madison had had faith in democracy. They really believed that people would do the right things. Hamilton did not. And um, you can look at a lot. You can look at a lot of our politics today. Hamilton may have been right. I don't know. <laughs> you know. Yes. You mentioned that. Benjamin Franklin had an influence on our scientific thing. How did he weigh in on the freedom of religion? Oh, he, he, was, a, he was a real liberal. Um, 
Yeah, Je uh, I, I think he was very much behind that. He was an old man, though, at the time of, of the uh, the Constitution. And the, um, if you you know, we want to think of, of um, Ben Franklin. Think of the whole. 18th century. He was born early in the century and, and died at the end. He really spanned that century. But he was a, we don't think of him as a great scientist. And he was a great scientist. And, and his discovery of electricity really changed minds because until then, and, and this is what the church has taught, the idea was that Earth was a place of decay and um, uh, elements that were corrupt and, and all of that, and that the heavens were heavenly and made of a heavenly element named ether, and there was no connection. You know, the stars and the sun and the heavens were were perfection, and he, Earth was corrupt. And and uh, so when Ben Franklin discovered that electricity was in the heavens and that there was a connection, that there was an element, you know, electricity was considered an element, not today, but um, that there's a connection and that some, something in the heavens was the same as on Earth. For thinkers, that was, that was powerful. That, be, that, that, was a, that changed a lot of things and it, um, whatever, yeah. The, the rule now is that in religion, institutional religion may not be taxed. Mm -hmm. and, and on the whole, they're completely tax exempt, their property is tax exempt, and so on. Was that part of the original thinking, or how did that come about? I don't know, but Madison would have said tax the guys. <laughs> I think. I, maybe he wouldn't, I don't know. But he, um, he just didn't think we should give priority to. He, he felt that, well, as he say, he thought. He thought Congress people should pay to have a minister come in and, and, and say prayers. He felt that the government should not be um, paying for religion. So in, in a sense, if you don't tax people, you're, you're supporting them. But that wasn't part of the initial debate. No, not, the, not that I'm, well, not that I'm aware. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've heard it said that Washington never owned and certainly never purchased a Bible. Can you confirm or refute that or ever hear of it? I can't. He was more, Washington was much more of a conventional person. I'd be surprised if he didn't, if he didn't have a Bible uh, around. And certainly his wife, but I, I don't know that. Well, I understand that he did go to church. Yes. He left before the communion service. Yeah, yeah, he was a deist, as, as most of them were. So they believed in God but not in the conventional religions. Yeah. So you mentioned Tom Jefferson's reference of the proverbial infidel. I was curious, like, as we're progressing in the Supreme Court case this year, with two atheists challenging, challenging legislative prayer, I mean, what was the general conception around infidels? Was it something not to be discussed? Was the establishment of religion really protecting interfaith um, turmoil? I mean, could we imagine that it was to be extended among outside? Uh, well, Je Jefferson and Madison definitely felt that, that, that she could, you know, uh, they talked about atheists, and they, you know, you, anybody has a right to be an atheist. Um, so I brought this book with me. Sam, do you want to hold this to my, my husband? Is, I brought two books that any of you who want to pursue these thoughts, I mean, I mean, I'm a writer, not, right now I'm writing about science. Actually, I'm writing about evolutionary biology, so my head is somewhere else. Um, so if you, if you really are interested and want to go on with these subjects and, and have authorities, um, this is a, um, a new book. Um, it's called Religious Freedom, Jefferson's Legacy, America's Creed. It um, was written by a guy named John Ragosta. This was recommended to me by, uh, it's published by the University of Virginia Press, and it was recommended to me by someone there. And he's a, a professor of history at Hamilton College. It's really good. Not beautifully written. I mean, it's it's a little bit dull, but but it's got, it's very well researched. And then this book I really um, have enjoyed, Thomas Jefferson's Koran, and it's all about his his. Uh, I mean, this guy was so bright and so had such an inquiring mind, and he was fascinated by Islam. And so yeah, he often and he he often talked about the fact that he I don't know if he 
really thought there would be Muslims here, but he, he kept talking about that possibility. And he always included infidels who were atheists. So he felt that, they, that that should be part of the American package. Uh, that it was no business of anybody's. Like, these are personal things, your, your beliefs. And it's certainly not the business of government. So thank you. Um, so we do have many treats over here. Um, all, a, a copy of each of Joy's books um, are in the back to look at. Um, I regret that we do not have copies to sell, though they are available on the internets. Um, and then we have this for you because um, we thought as a writer you might find use out of a pencil box. All right. <laughs> oh, wow. Thank you very much. That's yeah. nice. It's got yeah my name, the date. Wow, nice. Yes, thank you. And please take a moment and talk with each other, talk with Joy, have some crackers and hummus and cookies, and enjoy. Thank you again for coming.